Hey everyone, and welcome to your aerobic training guidelines lecture. So we are going to dive into how to take a goal of improving someone's either overall health or their aerobic fitness and uh, figure out exactly how would we how would we go about training that. So we'll take a look here at our general guidelines. Now, again, as a reminder, for our uh, aerobic fitness, we see health benefits for um, cancer, for osteoporosis, uh, with, with physical activity, in particular weight-bearing physical activities, and cancer as well. So it helps reduce the likelihood or the relative risk of uh, getting any of these uh, health conditions, but it of course wouldn't be an absolute deterrent or, or fix for those per se. Um, but that being said, uh, there are guidelines for those. So we have a couple of different sources, our ACSM and AH, uh, AHA, sorry, that uh, suggest somewhere between five days a week of about half hour of exercise per time, or you can break that half hour down into 10 minute increments and have again moderate intensity exercise or conversely if you're uh, say are only going to set aside three days of the week to exercise ideally they are at least for 20 minutes and um, a vigorous intensity okay so again going back to that idea of figuring out how to apply our fit principle okay now, not, uh, is not necessarily appropriate like these guidelines for uh, recreational athletes or high level athletes. Um, typically what you'll need is a higher stimuli for change. So you're gonna need uh, more intensity, longer duration, uh, depending on what the needs of that particular individual are and what their skill level is and what their goals are. Uh, guidelines like these though would uh, likely and are good for uh, power lifters and uh, more anaerobic sport based um, athletics. Well, I, I, again, primarily strength and power athletes. So uh, weightlifting based or resistance training athletes or individuals uh, in order to help with body co composition maintenance, but also just getting their general health benefits from, from aerobic activity. Because again, the evidence behind resistance training, there are uh, psychological improvements as well as some underlying um, physiological benefits, for example, having more muscle mass uh, into older adulthood helps keep our hormonal system uh, uh, improved as well as having more uh, lean mass or free fat mass, or sorry, fat free mass uh, will increase our bone density. So if we have better bone density, that's less osteoporosis. Obviously the psychological benefits of resistance training is great as well, including some, some body composition uh, maintenance as well. So again, it's not that there isn't any health benefits to strength or power training. It's just um, we get more found within the cardiovascular realm as far as cardiovascular disease prevention and cancers, as we've previously discussed. So this is great. We have this uh, baseline or entry level guidelines as far as uh, frequency and as duration, as well as intensity. So we got, have a number of our, our fit principles covered by these guidelines. But uh, what if we want to uh, perhaps take it to the next level or just have a deeper understanding of this? So when you go to prescribe uh, aerobic exercise for an individual, there are a number of things we have to keep in mind. Our fit principle, but also trying to ensure that these individuals are getting a minimum threshold for their aerobic fitness. So again, that will depend on the individual and how much tra uh, time they've had training um, so far or under their belts. And we'll go through we'll go through each of these and see how they apply. So, with our types of ac or aerobic exercise, sorry, we have jogging, running, cycling, spinning, anything with a continuous, repetitive kind of motion. 
will generally fall under aerobic exercise. Um, but you'll notice some things like dance. So you can think of like a Zumba class or even just dance in general. Uh, rowing again all, all kind of repetitive the the one difference or highlight here to make is trying to differentiate what would be weight bearing so where you're standing and carrying your body weight like running and jogging versus non weight bearing which would be cycling spinning um, uh, swimming for sure rowing as well as non weight bearing so those activities wouldn't have the same bone density um, help that a weight bearing activity would Okay, I one note here, and I, yeah, and and this I think is probably the most important note when trying to decide what physical activity to prescribe or maybe you yourself to enjoy is is just that like you should ideally enjoy this activity, and the idea is people are going to be more coherent or adherent, sorry, to their exercise programs if they enjoy what they're doing. Right? You can imagine people who already might not be super familiar with exercise trying to get in to do some sort of physical activity. And if you end up doing something that you don't really enjoy, you're not really going to uh, stay engaged with that activity. So again, the idea is find something that you like. Maybe you'll have to try uh, trial and error a number of activities, but find something that you, you enjoy and could do throughout life. Uh, and the other consideration would be whether it's uh, weight bearing or not weight bearing in particular for individuals who might be overweight or have a say um, problems with their knees or some sort of injury to some part of their body you'll ideally pick an activity that will not need or incorporate that okay. and we'll come back to the idea of cross training when we talk about um, uh, what a pro like an annual or a year-long exercise programming plan might look like. And ideally, uh, you're looking for a different activity than you typically do with the goal of using your body in a slightly different way to avoid overuse injuries or repetition-based injuries. Okay. Yeah, um, and when we're looking at how to look at the intensities and what sort of athlete you know, if we're talking about someone who um, has some sort of intermediate physical activity or background already under their belts, if we're looking at types, we can pick some more impact-based activities at a higher intensity. So again, even a moderate uh, kind of recreational athlete can engage in jogging and running, uh, dance, basketball, etc. Something a bit more sports specific. Uh, if your uh, client or person that you're working with hasn't been that active in physical activity um, or they're just getting started out with exercise and um, walking as I've mentioned before is a excellent way to get started in physical activity and especially if you couple that with say walking in uh, nature or near and around nature uh, that has its own psychological benefits as well, but uh, very casual cycling, aqua-based or aquarobics is amazingly um, fun and a uh, good entry level for, for people. Um, in particular, if you are working with, say, an uh, uh, individual who's obese, a lot of the time being in water, one, is actually a lot of work. It's uh, a lot of resistance for when you're doing uh, your motions and actions and movements in the pool but the other component of that is um, is it helps uh, unweight the body right because you're buoyant in water and so that can be uh, one very enjoyable and liberating for people who are uh, obese for sure um, and it's just they're kind of fun they play music usually an older crowd uh, which are quite entertaining at times okay uh, so that would be when you're considering intensity and type and who your individual is and how you might uh, go about prescribing some type and intensity of exercise. But if we were to continue on and figure out what is a threshold or a minimum amount, yes, we can have our multiple individual sessions, but generally speaking for today's um, people's lifestyles and uh, life balance, uh, generally having a one 
half hour, maybe up to an hour session is going to be uh, easier for them to achieve than multiple short sessions. Um, and yeah, you're really just looking to have these this hit. So for example, uh, we can play around with the intensity that we apply when we prescribe by, if we can't go for say a very long uh, exercise session, we can always increase the intensity. Now the thing to consider in that case is how well trained or what sort of base physical activity this individual has. Again, if they have very low uh, physical activity starting out, we probably do not want to give them high intensity exercise. That is a good way to get injured. Um, and in opposition to that, if we're giving uh, longer sessions, we can prescribe lower intensity. And both of these combinations have very similar uh, benefits to it or health gains. If we have a longer session, especially for aerobic activity, the, the minimum threshold really, it, it, I mean, it is about 10 minutes, but ultimately you're talking about 12 minutes of continuous activity. Um, you start really maximizing the gains from your aerobic activities at about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, again, depending on the intensity, which can be quite moderate at that point. Um, but ultimately, when you get to 30 to 60 minutes of moderate activity, what you get is you really start to reap the benefits of aerobic activity. So again, this is a minimum threshold. This would be more ideal. And um, higher intensity exercise, um, again, we don't want to give that to our big gainers because they have a greater cha chance of injury. So orthopedic injury would be things like sprains and strains. So you can think of like rolled ankles or uh, strained muscles, which will ultimately deter people who are just starting out to getting into physical activity um, and might uh, actually prevent them from continuing on with trying exercise. So we want to avoid that if we can. Yeah, um, if we're to move on to frequency, so that was speaking to the time or duration of each session. One of our T's in our FIT pr principle will go to frequency, so that's the F. And if we have about three to five days as far as our frequency, that's typically uh, spot on for most individuals as far as being reasonable. If you were to have a lower frequency, again, the idea is if we were going five days a week, you would have a moderate um, intensity and um, you know, uh, you can get away with a shorter duration of time. Uh, any ideal, and, and this kind of goes true for most things in life, is the magic number of three. So if you have three sessions uh, at a minimum, that's going to be able to um, help increase your peak oxygen consumption a little bit. Two would be a maintenance. And uh, this goes, I, I have seen this ring true in uh, with some of my clients and again uh, once a week is typically not enough to see any changes uh, maybe a bit of a maintenance maybe a very slow accumulation of improvement over time but you really need a minimum of two sessions this is for strength or aerobic activity to maintain a certain level of fitness and then three times to improve. And this is true for, uh, I would suggest anything from schooling, uh, learning a new language, uh, picking up a new um, vocational or job skill or uh, anything. You really need three, at least three times a week where you're dedicating time to it. And so we find that it holds true here as well. Um, after five days a week, and I would, I'll definitely say most endurance athletes, whether they're hobbyists or not, a lot of them, uh, in particular with triathlon, because you have three sports you're trying to maintain, you'll usually do about a six day a week um, training, training week, but you generally don't see any improvement with that extra time spent. So three would be the minimum to see improvement, five would be a bit of a maximum, and at five we see a plateau and five and after so what's really great is with a five day a week training program is you have a couple of days rest and recovery which is where truly the improvement happens 
if you recall, the exercise breaks down our muscles, breaks down our body, provides a stimuli, so that breaking down is a stimulus for our body to rebuild and uh, rebuild stronger. And so yes, again, having some time off is very, very crucial to improvement. Okay? And uh, again, these can vary in these activities. Uh, yeah, and I, th I think it, it's important to note this last point too, where if you have, um, like if your goal is uh, body maintenance or body composition uh, related goals, uh, so losing body fat, greater frequencies do tend to improve um, that management or, or fat body, um, sorry, body fat um, loss. And if you recall back to some of our hormonal system and um, uh, studies and, and how the body works is again we we have this bout of exercise and it's not just for an hour after but up to the next day we get uh, elevation in our metabolism so again having elevated work at uh, let's say even a well at a metab metabolic level uh, happen helps if you keep boiling that pot of water throughout the week versus um, lumping them just a few times towards one end of the week. Okay. Intensity. So here's the I of our fifth principle. How do we go about employing this and prescribing it? Well, ultimately, when you're starting out, start slow, start low, right? So with our low fitness, we can get some improvements for someone who's just starting out from about 30 to 40% of their heart rate reserve or vo2 reserve we'll discuss what that is in a few moments but it is a percentage of your max heart rate or usable um, range of heart rate okay and again when we go to prescribe intensity for cardiovascular or aerobic activities we do use heart rates primarily and as you know from lab work and your studies in this course is that our workload, as that imp uh, increases with how our body's working, we'll, we'll see that heart rate rise as well. And because most aerobic training is steady state continuous, the best way to ensure that's occurring is through heart rate. And so you kind of do a little bit of a warm up into your target zone, and then you stay there. And then during that, we'll ensure that you stay at the right effort level throughout your activity. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. And I, I think this is a great graph if you take nothing else out of aerobic training and programming or just your aerobic system. Please have this be one of the pieces of knowledge that you take with you. And it's just how direct of a linear relationship we have between heart rate and VO2, okay? So if you recall, VO2 is a volume of oxygen that we use, and this is a rate. Remember when you see things per minute or per unit of time, that is a rate. And so as we increase in our work rate, so our volume of oxygen needed for this activity, we see a correlational linear increase with our heart rate as well. So when we get to our max heart rate, what we can do is we can kind of work backwards to decide how hard we want someone working, right, as far as the rate. So if we know their maximum heart rate is 184 beats per minute, and we want them working at 91% of their VO2, or uh, sorry, for example, 85% of their VO2, we can calculate that, right? We follow the heart rate over, we drop down, okay, so they're max vo2 peak is predicted to be 38 we can also measure these things but let's assume it's predicted um, based off of whatever measures we have perhaps heart, max heart rate um, and then we'll calculate we'll multiply that by 0.85 or 85 percent and we will see that that gives us a target heart rate of 91 percent so if i was prescribing someone this activity i would say hey you need to work at Six, 168 or 169 beats per minute and you will get your appropriate VO2. If you remember 85% that correlates with our, um, our second uh, uh, anaerobic threshold or our OBL 
uh, A, so lactate threshold onset for our blood, and uh, this would be our first threshold. And so this would be the upper end of our anaerobic system and what it can handle for a prolonged period of time. Here at 70% would be our lower end, or roughly 50% of our VO2. We would definitely be crossing into um, past our VT1 there, right? Um, yeah, just to give you some ideas of some zones. And we'll see some more, more numbers to help us with that here. Um, so let's say you, again, uh, we, so, okay, let me back up. <laughs> we spoke about this in lab. Um, our max heart rates are really hard to measure. You'd have to not just do a sub-maximal effort test, but a full maximal effort test to all the way to the end, and that would be in something like the Bruce Protocol. Now, that's really challenging for even athletes, well-trained athletes to do, let alone Joe Schmo, who is just starting to get into a exercise regime. So how do we predict max heart rate? Well, we take 207 and minus 70% of their age in years. You might have heard, and I've used as an example before in this class, 220 minus someone's age, but it's more, excuse me, accurate to do this one. Yeah, so for a 20-year-old, if you're prescribing somewhere between 77 and 90% of their heart rate max, you use this second equation, 207 minus 0.7 or 70% of 20 years of age, you know, minus that, and what we get is 193. Then we take that, and because that is the maximum heart rate that this individual should be able to obtain theoretically, and then we multiply that by 77 and 90 percent respectively, and we see their zone that they're um, aiming for. Okay, so you would say I am prescribing an interval set of five minutes within this target zone or whatever it happens to be. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, all right, so another another way of using this as, as far as a max heart rate, so we can use a heart rate reserve. Um, when you're using heart rate reserve, what we're really talking about is the amount of usable heart rate, so it's a range and um, yeah, when we find we're looking at uh, heart rate reserve, you only need to do about 30 to 40% of your total reserve range. So the lowest your heart rate is, which is your resting heart rate, to your max heart rate, that's our range. And so again, 30 to 40% is uh, ideal to start for low fitness individuals. Moderate activity, activity starts getting up to 60% of your heart rate reserve, and vigorous gets up to about 90 Okay, and the way we calculate this is, um, yeah, again, we take our maximum heart rate as, as predicted or measured, and then minus our resting heart rate. So again, if you think your resting heart rate is your lowest your heart will ever be, the max heart rate is the highest it'll ever be, hence we have a reserve, okay? Okay. Uh, yeah, and then we can, for our target, we just multiply it by the intensity we're hoping for, much like we did previously. Okay, and so heart rate, again, is the go-to aside from VO2, but it's more commonly used, especially in exercise prescription for our aerobic athletes and aerobic hobbyists, uh, our fitness ingenues, and um, that's, that's the main best way to do this. Now, I want to be very, very clear. Once again, you, the heart rates that you get through your watches currently are generally only good for very low intensity exercise or activities of daily living. As soon as you start getting into higher aerobic um, states, uh, even, you know, anything kind of within this prescription area, if you're changing the intensities uh, frequently, um, and even then, it's they're, they're really not superb as far as accuracy. Okay, I've seen lots of data from at real world athletes or uh, recreational fitness hobbyists that use this and the data can be very bad sometimes. So always, 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 if you have a client prescribed through a heart rate chest strap, it is just the safest thing to do. Anything else would be, um, uh, would not be very good. Okay, it would be haphazard for sure. Okay, so this is 
measuring output as far as workload, there's another way we can gauge intensity and that's through perceived exertion. So our RPE scale. Now if we look at the Borg, and we'll take a look at that one in a moment, that goes from 6 to 12, or sorry, to 20, and our RPE for aerobic adaptation is about 12 to 16 range. And um, there's good, yeah, there's good correlation between uh, oxygen consumption and, and our RPEs. It shouldn't be the only way that we gauge work intensity, but it is another way that is relatively good. Um, in particular with people that are more experienced, people who are less experienced, this is less good for sure. The Omni uh, perceived exertion scale is similar, but it's just a one to 10. So for example, out of 10, how hard are you working? They'll say a number 10 being everything you've got. And that's also been shown to correlate fairly well to actual measured heart rates. The more uh, experienced an athlete is and more experienced with heart rates, the more likely they are to predict a true um, uh, RPE. And uh, again, you can just in your minds think of it if you ask this of a, a client or um, it, to try to check in and see how hard they're working. If it's out of 10, that's immediately giving you a, uh, a percentage. If you think about that, so it's like a nine out of 10 is 90%, five is 50%. And through that, you can roughly get a gauge of what their intensity is. But again, this shouldn't be the primary means of measuring intensity, but it is a good indirect measure of this. If we were to look at our Borg scale, um, again, it starts at six, has some words associated with it. So the client can hone in on that. But each of those words, you can then later uh, on your end, you're looking at that number and seeing what it correlates to. You can see the actual ranges and percentages here of their VO2 peak, maximal heart rate percentage, again, roughly, and uh, VO2 peak or heart rate peak reserves, rate reserves, or RHRR. Okay. So when you're doing your VT1 tests, of course, we didn't want you to be any more than about 35% of your maximum heart rate, right? A three or maybe a four out of 10 effort level is what it should have been. So at most, you should have been working very lightly or fairly lightly. Uh, so maybe a 10 um, out of a, a six to 20 scale, okay? Um, yeah, and again, just to show you a little bit what the Omni looks like, again, zero to 10, 10 being extremely hard. The warning zone is truly not a warning zone per se, but that correlates well, again, if you think about that with our anaerobic threshold, right? That about 70 to 85 percent. Okay. Good. One more way we can measure or try to generate a target for our aerobic um, outputs is not, or sorry, our aerobic exercise is not so much a output measure, but more so figuring out what an input effort level is or what a work rate is. That's our metabolic equivalence. Again, you would have come across this in lab. So our, our one met is at a resting state, which means um, if we were to sit here and do nothing, what is our metabolic rate? It assumes that is a 3.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And if you recall, that's actually sits as an addition on all your ACSM equations, okay? Every, on all of them, you'd see it at the end plus 3.5. Well, this is why. It's one metabolic equi equivalent. It is the metabolic equivalent of us sitting and doing nothing. But in actuality, it's a little different for everyone, right? So in reality, it's anywhere from 1.6 to 4.1 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And because of that, um, this isn't the best or most accurate way to figure out a work rate. However, it is useful when we're trying to picture or imagine or explain how much more challenging an exercise is relative to doing nothing. So moderate intensity would be three to six. Anything vigorous would be six or more. And sure enough, if we take a look at this table here, sitting on a couch, doing nothing is one met. Um, if we wanted to move up to a bit more moderate, um, we could be uh, moderately moving around and putting away groceries. That's getting closer to three mets. Um, 
Here's some working or vocational things. One of the more challenging ones, firefighting, hauling hoses on the ground. Hoses are actually very, very heavy. So certainly that would require a lot of um, metabolic activity to ensure we have enough energy for that. Um, and then sports, as we can see, uh, golf. If you're playing golf and just using a golf cart, that's your three and a half uh, mets. But if we want to get to something vigorous, boxing, punching a bag, that's higher. Broom ball or running at five miles per hour would definitely be considered some vigorous activity. Um, rowing at 150 watts, etc. Okay. Okay. Now, one of the output measures that we use to gauge intensity for the VT1 test is a version of our talk test. Now, usually if you're just starting out, this is a good gauge if you're using some incremental effort or um, graded exercise. And the reason for that is we have theoretical or predicted percentages of when people should start feeling fatigued, but that's not always the case. Some individuals, um, in particular when they're just starting out, don't know where that um, threshold or red line is. So using a talk test is a good way to get very immediate feedback as far as what their effort level is. Okay. Uh, again, I would, in and of itself, it's not necessarily a great way to determine uh, exercise intensity. As you all probably noticed, um, it is easy to uh, work around. So if people know that they, they are using their speech as a means of cutoff for a certain test, they will mask how, uh, when they're actually having their speaking being interrupted by their respiratory rate and uh, kind of force uh, a normal conversation, even though they've probably already crossed that 35, 40% of uh, uh, work rate. Okay. Okay, so we have some ideas about um, frequency, intensity, and time or length of time for each session. We've also spoken about type. So what sort of type of activities can you do for aerobic um, fitness or, or health or anything? But how do we actually progress it? Well, I gave you a little indication in one of the prior lesson, uh, lectures where we use VT1 and v, um, VT2, which are generally about 10 beats per minute apart as your uh, threshold between aerobic and then um, like a blended anaerobic aerobic uh, zone. And then the second threshold VT2, or as we know as our second lactate threshold we then get into uh, anaerobic activity where you're primarily just using carbohydrates um, in that system. And so you can set up intervals where you go in between two systems, increase the length when that becomes easy. Then you can start doing more steady state into that next level and then do intervals into the higher level from that. So from aerobic to mixed, uh, doing intervals until they start feeling um, easier to do continuously at a certain intensity uh, or sorry for a certain duration then you can do steady state for a time at that mixed intensity so between vt1 and vt2 or lactate threshold one and two and then you can start adding in intervals on that into your uh we can we'll say zone three or past your lactate threshold two or vt2 and then in that zone, after you've done some intervals, you can start trying to do some longer, longer intervals into that zone. But as we know, we have a limited amount of time in zone three on that model. So um, yeah, so that's one, one way to progress our aerobic fitness. Um, the other things to keep in mind is that it is type specific. So again, we wanna progress slow and low into all of these and then allow the body you know, a month um, to be able to adapt to these certain intensities at least with proper rest and recovery before progressing ourselves. So, when, uh, But the other thing to keep in mind is uh, the type of exercise is really important. So um, both when we're starting out and figuring out how to progress this, but also it's specific to our fitness level. 
So when we start, uh, we want to choose a low impact. So walking, cycling, elliptical, swimming. Then we can move on to high impact later on once we've started adapting to this. Again, that can be anywhere from one to three to six months, potentially, depending on who you are as an individual. Um, and then, you, yeah, and then uh, high in impact with jogging, running, jumping. Uh, but again, it's specific to the activity. So if you go from walking and you get a certain lot, a bit of uh, uh, fitness, let's say, built up, aerobic fitness, then you start cycling. Now, you do have some transference of that fitness from a lower body activity to another lower body activity, but because it slightly changes, um, you'll need a little bit of time to adapt to a new skill. Okay, and that's, that's true throughout. And uh, there's a big difference between uh, these low impact uh, exercises and the intensity that high impact exercises bring. They're much, much more significant. They'll jump up your heart rate really quickly, going from a walk and even just starting to jog, let alone run. Okay, But it's really important to keep in mind, again, for our overweight or obese individuals that are starting their exercise programs to keep it low impact as best you can. Oh, sorry. Um, our duration. So when you're programming and trying to progress, again, as beginners, you want to start uh, with duration of time uh, rather than really focusing on intensity or frequency. For example, if you said about a half hour activity, they, people will self-select, hopefully at a fairly low threshold, be able to do it for that length of time. And it's less important really for them to be hitting a certain intensity. In fact, lower is better at that point in time. And then you gradually increase that threshold again of duration from 20 to 30 minutes a day for those three to five days a week up to about 60 minutes a day. And so once you reach 60 minutes, if you recall back, that's really where you start hitting the threshold for health benefits for aerobic activity. But I just wanted to note that endurance hobbyists, so uh, runners, bikers, swimmers, triathletes, uh, rowers, cross country skiers, etc. They need, oh, spelling here, uh, they need more time. So for example, their base training at a low level of intensity for aerobic activity, let's say, you know, any anything below 70%, but I, I'd say even closer to like 50% of their heart rate or VO2 max. Um, yeah, uh, you're gonna be looking at anywhere from say like one and a half as a base time maybe two hours for their long duration activities uh, for running, uh, up to five, some even go up to eight hours for, for a bike, okay? But typically a three to four hour, maybe five hour bike ride on the weekend would not be atypical, it'd be pretty common, yeah. And uh, again, so we increase five to 10 minutes every session. Uh, that might be a little steep, but uh, definitely each week, you would increase that time on one of your sessions. So yeah, again, every one to two weeks for four to six weeks. So I gave that rough month guideline before you'd wanna start uh, increasing activities or intensities. That includes duration. Um, there is a thing called a 10% rule that floats out there um, in, in particular to increasing running. If you're a new runner, it works out well until about five to 10 kilometers, but then it starts um, getting to be a little much if you're going off a distance. So you can increase the time, but what ends up happening is that initially you get a nice graded increase of exercise, but by the time you uh, start nearing, let's say about 10K or 15K kilometers worth of time, now all of a sudden 10, um, like a 10% jump is quite significant. So again, keeping things kind of reasonable as far as its duration up to some of these thresholds, depending on what your goals are and who you are as an, uh, as a mover. Okay. Uh, intensity. Yeah. Again, that's related to duration. The longer you go, um, the less intensity you have, but that being said, once you get to a certain duration of time, you can slowly start increasing the intensity up to a certain point. So for example, you wouldn't be crossing too far beyond VT2 
on any given one of these um, times because it gets to be quite long, okay? You wouldn't necessarily be able to st sustain above it. Oftentimes, uh, well-trained endurance athletes can go to VT2 for about 20 minutes, theoretically up to 60, but the amount of recovery time you might need after would not be helpful. So a lot of the time people hit uh, a tempo or, or somewhere in the middle of uh, zone two and, that, uh, and that's where they'd sit once they get to about 10 to 12 minutes and then carry on until about 60. So yeah. Okay, so that was our aerobic fitness training or, or programming and things to consider. Uh, great, we'll see you for resistance training.